welcome back and welcome to lecture number seven, which is going to be on recursion. Uh, it was just brought to my attention that the bhacker.com site does not have the CSLO essay or the midterm on it, so I will find them and put them up there sometime this week. Um, so you'll have them, and then next week I'll go over them with the class. So just in case there's any questions or anything about it. Uh, the midterm is going to be a good question. Probably a cross between programming and multiple choice. Um, I actually haven't written the midterm yet. I have the CSLO ready. <laughs> that one was going to be an essay. I have to put together a midterm. So you might actually not see the midterm until this weekend, but definitely before next week. So the next Wednesday I can tell you all about them. Um, but I don't know. I haven't really decided on the midterm. Would you guys prefer programming stuff or would you prefer um, writing stuff? I know you're going to say writing. <laughs> That's why I'm going to make it programming. <laughs> All right, settled. Huh? You have four assignments on that. Programming. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you're right. All right, maybe I should do writing. Yes. I'll do a writing one. You got me. All right. We'll do writing. Um, it won't be like an essay writing. It'll be like um, answering some questions. So It is worth 25%, I believe, of your course grade. So I have to make them hard questions or long questions or something. You can read that answer and then you can cover that Yes. <laughs> All right, chapter objective of recursion. What was your question? Did I answer it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I just went, uh-huh. All right. <laughs> Whatever you're saying over there. <laughs> so, uh, chapter objectives. Okay, so today the big topic of the day is recursion. Recursion is one of those things that programmers do not like for some reason. It's kind of like pointers. When you talk to a C++ pro programmer, and you say, write a recursive function that does Fibonacci numbers. They look at you with this blank stare, like, why are you doing this to me? You know? Actually, that's a nice interviewing question, believe it or not. A lot of um, people who hire programmers, they'll have you like, you know, write a recursive function that calculates Fibonacci numbers or something, or that does factorials or something. And it's a good test to see how afraid the programmer is <laughs> to create a function that does a recursive call. And in reality, it's actually quite simple. But recursion is one of those things that people just shy away from. So if I were giving a, an interview, I usually prefer to ask pointer-related questions uh, instead of recursion because recursion is too easy. So people could probably get that one right. In essence, those examples, all you have to do is write a function that calls itself. So a function that calls the function itself, there you go. You've just created recursion. <laughs> so we're all done today. No, nothing else to talk about. Um, so the chapter's got a little bit more information in it. And the chapter talks about, explains the underlying concepts of recursion, examining recursive methods, and unrevealing their processing steps. Mm, I'll show you a little template on how to actually create a recursive function. It's the same in all languages. So you learn it once. By concept, you can implement it in C++, in Java, in Visual Basic, and anything you're programming with. Uh, defined an infinite recursive and discuss the ways to avoid it. We don't want infinite recursion. Uh, explaining when recursion should and should not be used and demonstrating the use of recursion to solve the problem. It's the objective of the lecture. Recursive thinking. So recursion is sort of like iteration or looping. In fact, it's commonly uh, avoided by creating a loop or by creating some iterative process that does things for some sort of fixed amount of times or, you know. And uh, looping and recursion has its pros and cons. Recursive functions can call to a certain point and then it can stop and the point can be different. It may not necessarily be the same number of times like in a fixed for loop type of situation. Recursive, recursion is the thinking technique, programming technique in which the method can call itself to solve a problem. If I had a list of numbers and I wanted to add the numbers together, and I had numbers 1 through 5, I could send 1, and let's say the numbers were 1 through 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, <laughs> I could send 1 and 2 to the function and then add it to 3 and 4 and then add it to 5, and I could basically create a recursive function so that at the end of the first two it would come back up and say, Here's the result, and then give me the next number. 
add the next number to it, and then the function call would return back up to itself and say, well, call me again. And all the function call does is add the number with the result, number with the result, and then call itself again. Which I could easily take and create, you know, let's say, uh, an easy way of using a function. I could also create a for loop <laughs> and take the numbers and add them all up to themselves as well. Um, so in some cases, a recursive function, believe it or not, makes it seem simpler, makes the code less uh, con convoluted, makes it more re easy to read and understand. And then in some ways, people just don't like recursion, so no matter what it looks like, they, don't, they think a loop is a lot better. So there's a lot of controversy in terms of whether or not recursion is actually needed. Some languages, like functional programming languages, they live on recursion. Everything is recursive. You send a function to a function to a function, and it's nothing more than functions that are calling each other recursively until we finally get a result. So you might think of it whenever you have to do something over and over again, and it's the same identical thing. Why not just have the function do it again with the result of the function? And you're usually sending something, like a piece of information, like a number or a counter, um, to the function call. So, and at the end of the function call where the return is, the return line is generally return, and then it's, you've got a function call that it's returning. Like you're returning, and here's a function call, <laughs> and it's itself again. So right before it returns, it calls itself. So it never actually does return. So what ends up happening, especially in the C++ language, you know, you have a bunch of activations. They're called activation records in the runtime environment. When a function is built to run in the runtime environment, it's loaded up on what's called a stack. Stack fills up with the function, and it says, okay, call the function again. So we get yet another entry of stacks that are created for the new function that are called. Because each one of those function calls is kept separately, and there's a placeholder in the stack for the return of the function. So if you're in main and you call the function, Main doesn't go away, it's still loaded on the runtime stack. But new stack entries are opened up, the function code is loaded in those new stack entries. The return from that function code goes back to a placeholder in main where you left off. So one of the biggest problems with recursive functions is that they fill up the stack entries. <laughs> it's like function call after function call after function call, and none of them can go down, none of them can go away because they're not done yet. So you fill up the stack, and then, you rec then the stack, one by one, goes back down in size when the function call returns happen. But the returns aren't going to happen until you make that very last function call. So, long story short, recursive functions call create stack overflow errors, <laughs> or runtime errors, and the program crashes. So your support of it to avoid those types of problems is not to use it extensively, like the entire program just does recursion for five hours or something. Actually, probably after the first five minutes, the computer's going to be crashed anyway. <laughs> the runtime environment's going to be crashed. Um, but to use it for a particular problem solving when it makes sense and make sure the recursive call always ends. If there's not a stopping point, your program's not going to survive, which is kind of different from looping because you could create what's called a state machine which is actually data structure, believe it or not. It's just a loop that never ends. But the loop's not putting, creating more stack entries. The loop is just going, you know, while x doesn't equal exit, <laughs> or e, or q, uh, throw up this menu. And the menu just never goes away. Every time you run something, it goes back to the menu, back to the menu, which is a state machine uh, environment. So that doesn't cause stack overflow errors because it's not calling a function over and over again. And we're not creating any stack entries with that. So a recursive definition is one in which uses the words or concepts being defined in the definition itself. In terms of a recursive function to calculate Fibonacci numbers or factorial numbers would be an example of a definition of a recursive definition. Some situations recursive definitions can be the appropriate way to express a concept. Uh, before applying recursive, recursion to programming, it's best to practice thinking recursively. So let's think recursively. <laughs> so, some definitions. So consider the following list of numbers. We've got 24, 88, 40, and 37. Such a list can be defined recursively. We could have a list. A list 
is a mem number, or a number comma list, number comma list. So that is a list can be a number or a number followed by a comma followed by a list. Hmm. The concept of list is used to define itself. A list kind of is self-inclusive in terms of its description of a list. So here's tracing the recursive definition of the list. So the list is a number, a comma, a list. And this is sort of the um, concept that it's not in relationship to functions, it's in relationship to the logic. So if the list equaled or is equivalent to or defined by a number, a comma, and a list, as an example, 24 comma, and then we have the rest of the list, considering that this was the original list that we looked at, 24, 88, 40, and 37. So here's the rest of the list. And then we have a number 88 followed by a comma, and then we have the rest of the list, 40, 37, and then we have the, the number 40, comma, 37, <laughs> 37. This is recursive thinking, because we're going through first item, second item, third item, fourth item, fifth item, and we're defining the first item by the by the structure. First item is the first item, comma, the rest of the list. Second item is the first and the second item, or the second item, comma, the following the regular of the list. So tracing a recursive definition of a list would sort of look like this. We could trace the function calls if we were to apply this to a recursive function call, which we're going to do in a few minutes, <coughs> that um, makes this smaller. Point being, as we think recursively, we're coming down to one number. We're starting with one number, the beginning, and we're getting to the end of this particular list started with 24 as the number and we ended with 37 as the number. So each recursive call is making the list smaller, which is the point that you need to consider, which is the goal. Recursive recursion is when you want to go through it iteratively till you get to the end and there's a stopping point, hopefully. And that stopping point's a clear spot. With infinite recursion, it doesn't have a stopping point. <laughs> If you had main that just called main that just called main that just called main, your program would never stop running. It said, let's say you had hello world, and at the end of hello world it said main, and then it called main, and then it said main, called main. You'd probably get a stack overflow error with that. That is because it's infinite. It never stops, but it keeps calling main over again. Your program never quits. So that would be an irritating program. <laughs> In fact, a lot of viruses do recursive behavior. If you think about the concept, there's one, uh, they used to call it the spiral. I think it was a worm, actually, not really a virus. It used to black out the screen pixels, and it did like this little swirl, and it, it did like a spiral on your screen until you couldn't see any of your screen anymore. <laughs> but it did a recursive calculation on the point where your mouse was, and then it, it just slowly filled in from that point forward or something. I don't know. It did some sort of recursive call, so it finally filled up the entire screen with black dots so you couldn't see anything. <laughs> Your screen turned black eventually. Uh, which is kind of easy to create if you think about it. If you have a program that's going to do that. So one problem is you have to you can't really make one for Windows. That was like a, that was a DOS virus actually in the old days. DOS worm. Old antique virus. And on a slightly slight tangent because I talked about viruses. Viruses are pretty easy. They're just programs. Malicious programs that do stuff. And they're pretty easy to write, actually. You can easily create a recursive virus. You know, just create an in infinite recursive call and put it on your uh, command.com. <laughs> Replace your, you know, or something, and then all of a sudden, you know, your, pro your, pro your computer only boots up for two seconds and then the whole thing crashes because you replace that file with something that, you know, did kind of look like the same thing, but it had a recursive call at the end that ate up all your memory, that ruined the runtime stack for that process that was running, and that process was pretty critical to the operating system. So, which is like the theme of a lot of the antique viruses. Nah, with Windows, we got totally separate things going on these days. You can't replace system files anymore. Virus protection software protects you from that. It is classic though when you don't have virus protection software to see which files you can actually replace. Like the boot up files. Well, okay, last last tangent because this is kind of interesting. You know, 
you can turn the computer on, you know, and there's a boot file. It's actually a file you can edit yourself to put up your own, like OEM, you know, Dell or whatever. You're... Anyway, some lovely virus people, they put like a picture of pirates or worms or bugs. <laughs> all you have to do is replace one file. And then all of a sudden, you know, you turn the computer on, whoa, what's that? Some bugs on my computer. <laughs> It doesn't do anything. It just irritates the user. How'd that happen? That's one file in your Windows system. But virus programs are too smart. They know that. So protect write, reading and writing to those files. All right, back to infinite recursion. Slight tangent. All recursive functions must have a non-recursive part. It must have an ending point. And if they don't, there's no way to terminate the recursive path. If it's going to call itself, it's going to call itself, it's going to call itself. He needs a stopping point. So a definition without a non-recursive part causes infinite recursion. It's kind of like infinite loop. Problem is similar to infinite loop with the definition itself causing the infinite looping. A non-recursive part often is called the base class or the base case. We have the base case, which is the non-recursive part that does a check. If i is equal to zero, then quit. <laughs> Means we went through 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We're done. And then it basically provides a definition for the end or the quitting point, the non-recursive part. So here's some recursive definitions. Mathematical formulas are often expressed recursively. So for positive numbers n, is defined to be the product of the integers of n and 1 and n inclusively. So the definition can be expressed recursively, where n is equal to n times n minus 1, n minus 1, n minus 1, which is the factorial. So a factorial is defined in terms of another factorial until the base case factorial is reached, 1 factorial. So for factorial, also for Fibonacci numbers, very common. You see it in most textbooks. Is def you know, they're, 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 they lend themselves really nicely to recursive examples, actually. So we have a method in Java that can invoke itself. What is a method in Java? It's a function. So this can be done with C++. It can also be done with um, object-oriented, you know, or I should say C, not C++, but also done in C++. Procedural, object-oriented, declarative, imperative, any type of language you have can support recursion. Uh, functional languages heavily support recursion. Usually math languages support recursive behavior as well because that's when it really makes sense. So you set up a method in Java and uh, it's set up in a way in which it called, it's called the recursive method uh, because it's calling itself. The code of the recursive method must be structured to handle both the base case and the recursive case. Now, base case is the check to see if we should call ourselves again. If not, don't call ourselves again. And then we have the other case, which is the recursive case. So, some people call it the incremental case. I go base case, other case. <laughs> this really is recursive case. Each call sets up a new execution environment with new parameters and new local variables. Uh, as I mentioned before, those are the stack entries I alluded to. So. Each recursive call to that function sets up a new function, puts it on the stack, calls it. So, as always, uh, when the method completes, control returns to the method that invoked it, which may be another instance of itself. So, so let's consider a recursive programming example, to make sense. And uh, consider the problem of computing the sum of all of the numbers between 1 and n. This is what I gave you before. <laughs> So I got 1 and 5, between 1 and 5. So n is 5, and we want to compute all of the numbers between 0 and 5, or 1 and 5. And the sum is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Well, we could easily write a program that does n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 1 plus n minus 1 plus n. Because what are we doing? We're taking n, it's going to be our result, with you know, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So we're always taking, if n is 5, we're going, well, 5 plus n minus 1, n minus 1 is now 4, n minus 1 is now 3, plus n minus 1, well, 2. Or we could set up a function that does it for us. So in the function, we take n, and it adds it. So we take n, and all we have to do is take n in there, and adds it to n minus 1. 
and then we send n minus 1 back to the function, and the function takes n minus 1 to n minus 1, <laughs> and then n minus 1 to n minus 1, which gives us our, our first simple example of recursion. Problem can be expressed recursively as the sum of 1 to n is n plus the sum of n to n minus 1. All right, let's see it. Here it is. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> I hate this notation. And the sum of the numbers n, this is the same thing, just done in mathematical notation instead of in English. Define recursively, this is the sum of n, n is equal to 1, n is equal to n plus n minus 1, where n is equal to n plus n minus 1 plus n, and we have recursively going from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 5, or n. So the sum of n through n sum of numbers 1 through n defined recursively. And no, you don't have to write mathematical notation for this course. This is what you have to write for this course. And here's that function I was talking about. So we have this public integer sum. It takes on a parameter, which is going to be the number. So we have integer results. We have a temporary variable to hold the result. If n is equal to 1, then the result is equal to 1. And we're done. Well, not really going to return result. Else, the result is equal to n plus, the result is equal to number plus sum. Here we go. This is our recursive call right here. Sum number minus 1. So for at 1, we're done. If we're taking 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, when we hit 1, we're done. So anything above 1 is going to end up in this else category because it's not equal to 1. Otherwise, the result is equal to 1. We're going to return the result, which is going to be 1. So the base case normally returns the last number in the list in this particular case, or the end of the recursive calls, where we don't have to do any more calculations on those numbers. We're all done. We have the result. The non-base case is this recursive call. It is often, you often kind of see this with the return uh, but normally you see it right before the return on the else. Usually people put the check for the base first, and then they put the rec recursive call second. You could switch it and put the recursive call first, and then go, well, you have to change the logic. If n is, you know, larger than 1, do this recursive call, and then underneath it go the else. Well, if n is equal to 1, or else if n is equal to 1, return it. This is a little cleaner, logic-wise, to put the base case first and then put the recursive call second and then put the return at the end. So the return always has to go at the end anyway. But here's a recursive call. So if n is uh, the sum, if, if n is not 1, if it's 2, 3, 4, 5, then the result's going to equal to number plus, because we're summing all this stuff up, plus the sum, which is this function call, sending it to 5, minus 1, which is going to be 4. So 4 gets put up in here, and then now 3 gets put up in here, and now 2 gets put up in here, and when 1 makes it in, we're done. We're not, do we're not taking this else anymore, and we just return it. This is probably the best recursive, easy to understand recursive function that exists on the market. <laughs> which, if so I want to say, you know, write a recursive function to add up the numbers between 1 and 5, so that's pretty easy. Yeah. 1 in 10, 1 in 1,000. It gets a little bit more complicated when you're doing a little bit more math to it, when you're trying to come out and calculate something that's a little bit more complicated than just a simple addition. However, although this is a simple one, oh, I can write that. That's pretty simple. Why would you? <laughs> it's overkill. In this particular case, I'm not quite sure I would write a recursive function for this solution. It, it, I could but it seems a bit overkill for the, to write an elaborate recursive function call to add up five numbers. Although, n could be anything. It doesn't have to be five. It would work in all cases, which has its advantage. Because what if you don't know how many you got? Your user enters in a number, and uh, you got to calculate up everything. Maybe it's a GP. Maybe it's, maybe it's going and not calculating and adding numbers, but it's calculating your GPA. How many classes is each student taking? Not every student takes the same number of courses. Some students might have three to average out. And it could be calculating an average, you know, taking and adding up all your courses and dividing it by the number. And it could actually do it recursively because, you know, n would be, 
you know, essentially the number of classes that you have, <laughs> and then go through. If you set up another loop, then you'd be assuming that the student, what if a student came in, they took 15 classes, and another student took five classes. The loop set up that you pre-programmed ahead of time is either going to have to be way too big for the problem solution, which means it's going to loop extra times unnecessarily, or it's got to be on the fly somehow adjusted dynamically to account for the number. So you know, it does come in handy for some things. Here's a recursive call to the sum of the method, and this is actually kind of interesting. From main, we've got, uh, we're calling sum 4, sum 3, sum 2, sum 1. Sum started out as 5, or actually we're going 4, 3, 2, 1, I guess. We send, and this is what I was talking about in terms of the recursive call and those stack entries. Main is going to say, look, we have a call to sum. It's going to come out and it's going to, I think they sort of like stack entries almost creates the stack entry for the function sum, passes to it the value, in this case, 4. Why don't we just start out with 5? I don't know. Well, all right, we're going to go 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> so we took we sum 4. We called the function with sum 4, and then we called it with sum 3, and we called it with sum 2, and we called it with sum 1. Now sum is kind of going back and say, oh, the result's 1. Return. When it returns, it returns, it returns, it returns. <laughs> All the returns happen in the reverse order as the function calls. This is what causes the stack overflow error. Because if you keep creating, 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 eventually you're going to run out of stack space. And uh, if you're familiar with the process and the way most operating systems divide out the process space or the memory that's allocated per process, we have the heap and the stack, and they normally grow together in the runtime environment. And the stack's going to fill up, and it's essentially going to overflow the memory that's allocated for it. It's not going to overflow the memory on the computer. That's sort of impossible. But for that process space, you're going to, the process is going to bomb out on you. The program, your program's not going to work. You're going to get a stack overflow error. Because until those returns happen, everything is still active. Everything is still out there running, which is why they call them activation records. They activate functionality. While they're active, they're still accessible. They're still within the scope of the program. When they get done is when that return just goes back to the placeholder. Result 1 comes back to this one. Result 2 goes back. Result 3 goes back. Result 4 goes back. So if we didn't have a recursive function call, it would be like this, and then this would go away. It would just be this one little circle right here with a main calling the sum and going back to main, calling the sum, going back to main. So. Recursion versus iteration. So just because we can use recursion to solve a problem doesn't mean we should. <laughs> well, like and then counting up those numbers is more of an iteration overkill. It's more of a recursion overkill is what I called it. Uh, for instance, we should really would. Yeah, we usually would not use recursion to solve the sum of 1 to n. And iteration version is easier to understand. In fact, there's a formula that is superior to both recursion and iteration in this particular case, the summation. So you must be able to determine when recursion is correct and when it should be used versus other techniques. So every recursive solution has a corresponding iterative solution. There's absolutely no case in which you can apply iteration instead of recursion. So that's kind of a trick question as well, because when you think about it, you go, well, is recursion really needed then? If For every recursive function that you can write, you can write a loop for it. You can use iteration instead of it. There's an equivalence. Well, if you can't understand the loop, the loop is too complex, then the recursive solution may actually be easier because <laughs> it's less code, it's less convoluted. So people select recursive solutions because, believe it or not, it's easier to understand. Although intuitively you think, oh, that's hard. You know, it just looks hard. It's not really, it's just unfamiliar, just different from looping. So, for example, the sum of the numbers between 1 and n can be calculated with a loop. Recursion has the overhead of multiple method invocations. Yep, same problem with function calls. Method invocations is going to eat up your memory. However, the same problem, recursive solutions are often more simple and elegant 
than iterative solutions. You're wondering, how in the world can they be simple and elegant? <laughs> well, actually, that one function was not too bad. It's just one little function, and it just sits there. And it just calls itself. Not too bad. It's pretty elegant. Indirect recursion. A method invoked, invoking itself is considered to be direct recursion. A method or a function calling itself over and over again is pretty direct. It's direct. A method could invoke another method, which invokes yet another method, until eventually the original method is invoked again. That's indirect recursion. When it calls itself, it's direct. When it calls another function that invokes another function that creates this huge circle of functions <laughs> all the way back to the beginning, that's indirect. Because it's still calling itself. It's still eventually coming back to itself. But it has all these intermediate steps in between. So example, in method number M1 could invoke M2, which invokes M3, which goes back and invokes M1 again. So that's the difference between the direct and the indirect. Also called indirect recursion, it's often more difficult to trace and debug. Yeah, because you're looking at this going, oh, i got 25 different methods all calling each other. It's kind of like going through a bunch of nested if-then-else's. If then Finally at the bottom you go, what's the logic? <laughs> what if x is 5? <laughs> Where is it going to end up in this? And then most people would just compile it and run it and see, test with a bunch of x's and go, okay. The logic's right. I don't understand the code, but the logic's good. It's working. M1 goes to M2, goes to M3, goes back to M1, M2, M3, goes back to M1, M2, M3. M3 goes back to M2, M1. So we get, this is the indirect method where we've got subsequent method calls happening indirectly that eventually take us back to the original method that ran. Methods and functions, same thing. It can be functions as well. Maze traversal. Oh, it does create a maze. Let's use recursion to find a path through a maze. Here's where a recursive solution could come in handy. So here's our practical example. So a path can be found through a maze from location X in the path that can be found from any of the other locations neighboring X. So we can mark each location we encountered as visited. And then we can have to counter all of the locations. <laughs> and then attempt to find a path from that location's unvisited neighbors. So recursion uh, will be used to keep track of the path through the maze using a runtime stack. Okay. The base cases are a prohibited block move. If it's blocked, it can't do it. Or arrival at a final destination. So if it arrived at a final destination, we stop. The recursion is over with. If we hit a visited one or a blocked one, we know we've already been there. We're not going back. So we're not going to travel in a circle. <laughs> we're going to make it from point A to point B, hopefully. Here's our code for it. So here's our maze search 2. So we got a class called maze search 2. Creates a new maze. Prints the original form. Uh, attempts to solve it and prints out the final form, the final path traversal. In main, we're going to create a labyrinth. So we're going to create a new maze too. And we're going to uh, system out. We're going to print out the original path that we, we've got. And these are this is the object actually of maze two, which is actually works with the previous chapter's example. And I can't remember what that one was. I think it was a list actually. I believe maze two was a list. No, it was a map using the Java collections. I believe it was a tree or a map, if I remember this right. Um, believe it or not, you can actually go to the author's website and <coughs> download these examples, and they all work together, which is kind of interesting, all the classes from each one of the chapters. But in this particular one, we are going to say the maze was successfully traverses the end of it, else print out there's no possible path, which is the other base case. So either we visited all the spots, but we can't make it through the maze, we can't get through, or we've made it through, <laughs> so which is our two options. And so here's the method here, or no, here's the, the maze. It is a list of numbers. So we're going to create a grid here. So 
The maze represents the maze of characters. The goal is to get from the top left corner to the bottom right corner diagonally through the through the grid that we're going to create, followed by the path of ones. So we have triad is three, path is seven. We're going to just set these initial values of how we're going to change the numbers that are in this grid. And the grid is going to be a two-dimensional array. It's going to hold this. We're just going to change the numbers in the two-dimensional array, essentially. To say we visited, we didn't visit it. To keep tr recursively trying to find different sets of uh, numbers that might work. So the attempt to the recursive traverse of the maze inserts special characters indicating the location that has been tried and that eventually becomes part of the solution. So if it's on the path, it gets marked as a path space. If it's been tried and it's been visited, but it's not on the path, it's going to be marked as a visited space, but not part of the path. Um, so here we have Trevor's. So we have the row and the column, or two spots of that two-dimensional array. Our Boolean done, which is going to be false. And we're going to set done to true when we're all done. So if a valid row and column on the grid equals tried, make the row and column tried if it's valid, so we're going to set it. If the row and column and the column is uh, done, then we're done with the maze and make it equal to done. If, if, if we've hit the end, the right, lower right-hand corner of the grid, we're done. That's the check for that one. And then <clears throat> done is equal to traverse row plus one column down to the right, up, left, Essentially what we've done here is, this is the traverse method. Here's the traverse method. Oops, here's the method. <laughs> Public Boolean traverse, which is taking a row and a column. So we're sending to the method, just like a function, we're sending to the method a row and a column, and we're trying it out. If it is part of the path, we're marking it. If it's the destination, we're done. I seriously doubt we're going to hit the destination on the first try. So instead, we're going to move down, we're going to move to the right, we can move up, we can move left, right. And uh, if it's not done, if it's not done, it's going to try, try some of these things. If it can't move down, it has to move to the left or to the right. So it's first going to go down. So done is equal to go down, row plus one, comma, column. It's going to go down to as far as it can go. <laughs> Because it's never going to hit if not done. Done is equal to here. So then it's going to go to the right. Then it could go up, and then it can go to the left, essentially. So it can't actually go backwards. So. If the done this location is part of the path, the grid and the path, and mark it part of the path. So you mark the space path. And then eventually we're going to return done. So what we've done is come through a bunch of cases to traverse through the grid, going from the upper left-hand corner to the lower right-hand corner, going down first, and then recursively calling the function over again to try the different spaces until we eventually determine that we are done. <laughs> and then either we're done that we have not found the solution or we're done and we found the solution. Um, so here's valid, and for valid, we're marking it. With uh, if it's valid, we're sending it the row and the column, and we're checking to see if the bounds are in the matrix. If they are, then we're going to uh, mark it. Essentially, result is equal to true, and return the result. So yes, we're valid. So check to see if we're valid, and then we can return the maze as a string at the end, so two string, and uh, print out the maze, which is basically using a for loop to go through the both dimensions of the array to print out the grid again. So. It's a pretty interesting example, actually, that kind of shows the concept of um, how you could, you don't know exactly how many spots you're going to go through, but you're going to recursively just traverse down, 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 and then to the left, to the right, depending upon where you get stuck, if you can't go to the other directions, um, until you finally find the lower right-hand corner. So, and you're just sending it traverse, traverse, so you're just marking the spaces as you're going down which is a recursive kind of behavior. So here's the UML description of the maze and the maze search classes that are included with that. <clears throat> so we have maze search, which has got the main string with the, uh, you know, just the main program. And then the maze itself, which has got the, I tried this path, because if we tried it, we're not going to try it again. 
this is part of the path and then we have the grid as the data elements and then the functionality is that traverse the valid and the two string if it's valid we're going to keep her along that track it's kind of like if it's wrong we're not going to take that track anymore <laughs> that's not valid so this is what the program would look like in terms of um, the interfaces between if we were putting it in UML notation. So the towers of Hanoi, as I say that right? I don't know. Another puzzle, classic puzzle, I probably should be able to recognize it. Towers of Hanoi. How do you say that? Hano? Hanoi? Hanoi? Uh, it's a puzzle made up of three vertical pegs and several disks that slide into the pegs. So, the disks are of various different sizes, initially placed on one peg with the largest disk on the bottom, and initially smaller disk on the top. And the goal is to move all of the disks from one peg to another following these rules, and the rules are only one disk can move at a time. And a disk cannot be placed on top of the smaller disk. So, it's like those three pegs. So, you move the disks over. <laughs> Never good at these games. All of this must be on the same peg except for the one in transit. So here it is. We got these three. <laughs> we got to move them over to here. And uh, only one disc can move at a time. And the disc cannot be placed on top of a smaller disc. So you have a big disc on the bottom, little disc on the top. Okay. You can move this one to here, this one to here, this one to here. <laughs> it's recursive. Here's some solutions here. A solution for the three disc tower of Hanoi <laughs> puzzle. Yeah, someone's going to call me on my lack of pronunciation. Alright, so we got the first move. Here's the original configuration. Given this configuration, we may not necessarily start out with this configuration. We might start out with a different one. If they were upside down, it'd be easy. Just take them all this way. <laughs> if this were upside down, then we wouldn't follow the rules correctly. So I'm going to pull the first one off, put it over here. Pull the second one off, put it over here. Put this guy on top of here. Move this guy over here. Move this guy back here. Put this guy over here. <laughs> this guy on top of here. Let's see if I got this right. Uh, no, no, no. This guy on here. This guy on here. Basically, we're stretching it out the opposite direction. Then we're going to put this guy back on here and this guy back on here, and then voila, we're done. We all get that? Yeah. It's kind of a stupid. I shouldn't call it stupid. It's this could get more complicated if we had one too few pegs, like in this example here. This has got one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's only two spots to put them on. <laughs> a little bit more challenging. Then three with three spots. <laughs> so, you can write a program to do this recursively. Because what are you doing? Actually, if you think about it, it's a pattern that you have to do in a certain order. So your base case, in this particular case, I can verbally tell you the solution to this problem, actually. The base case is to say, Put one at the end, send it to itself. I guess if this is the function, you're going to send it to itself at the beginning to put the little guy over here, the second one over here, and then it's going to go back to the base case and say, well, can we add them up anymore? No. Then take an alternate case, and the alternate case is going to be to put this one over here or this one over here, depending upon which one's smaller. So it's going to check to see which one's smaller. If not, if this one's smaller than this one, move this one to this one, and then go back to the original. So you, I could see a recursive function going forward and then back, forward and back, essentially, through each one of the calls to essentially separate out and then move back in the opposite direction. So to move a stack, so to move the stack of n disks from the original peg to the destination peg, you move the topmost n minus 1 disk from the original peg to the extra peg. So n minus 1 is pulling the first disk off the top. Move the largest disk from the original peg to the destination peg. Move the n minus 1 disk to the extra peg to the destination peg. So, and then the base occurs when the stack contains only one disk. So when this is spread out, 
and we're down to one, we're back at the original <laughs> function, and we hit the base case, and then we can recursively perform the next round. And the next round is going to essentially build this back up. So note the number of moves increases exponentially as the number of disks increase. Uh, because we have the more moves to make. And the recursive solution is simple and elegant to express <laughs> and to program. An iterative solution to this problem is much more complex. If you had to write a loop for this, perhaps, it's supposed to be more complex. Let's take a look at the function call. Uh, public class solve towers, where we're going to create the towers of public solve it. Uh, so in main, we got the tower of Hanoi towers <laughs> equals new tower. We're going to put four of them on there. Uh, four towers, I should say. And then we're going to call solve. And solve is going to be the method that we're going to use to solve it. And uh, that was main. Out here we have a private uh, total disk that we're going to have, integer total disk, set it up, specified number of disks, and then uh, total disk is equal to disk, so that was the original disk. From the initial call to move the tower to solve the problem, moves the tower from tower 1 to tower 3 using tower 2 as an intermediate step. And then we're going to call it solve. Solve is going to say move tower total disk 1, 3, 2. This is total disk, total power, and here we have move power. Move tower is up here with the number of disks, starting position, end position, and the temporary position. Where we're going to say if the number of disks is equal to one, we're down to the last disk. That's the base case. Then we're going to move one disk. <laughs> so this is what I would consider an indirect recursive uh, solution because we're calling other methods. We're not calling the first solution actually called the same function or method over and over. So it was more it would be considered a direct recursive solution. This is an indirect recursive solution because we have a different situation occurs when each peg only has one disk. So when we only have one disk, we start over so we call another we call another method to initiate that. Else Move tower, that's the recursive call right there. Number of disks minus one to start the temp the end. Move tower, start end, move tower. <laughs> so we've taken them all out, essentially. So we have multiple moves for three disks to take them out. So print the instructions to move one disk from the specified start tower to the specified end tower. This is the little move one disk. And here's the move one disk move one disk versus move tower. So we really have two two methods going on that we're calling recursively in sort of an indirect way. So here's our UML description and that was actually kind of a simple solution if you think about it. It would have been a lot more complex to set a looping up for it without using a recursive method. I think, I don't know. Some people don't think recursively though. So. Here's the UML description of the solve towers and the solve towers of and then we classes. <laughs> Solve Towers has got main program and it uses this main class and the main class has got the Solve, the Move Tower, which is going to have the integer, start integer, end, and the temp, and then the move one disk. So we have the two recursive functions that are calling themselves because we can't do the same thing. We can't do the same move over and over again. And we could find a recursive solution to a checkers game, actually or to a chess game and there's you can see out on the internet there's a ton of examples recursive solutions to chess to check because there's only so many moves and actually some of these solutions can go through from one move you move a checkers piece to a certain position it can tell you who's going to win who's going to lose <laughs> depending upon the correct moves after that so after you move it then it can recalculate it and it can tell you you're going to win they're going to win from that move because you can recursively go through the rest of the moves in the terms of the path, calculate out where you're going to end up. And if you're not going to end up in the winning position, then you're not going to win. So. And it might be easier to do that than it would be to, to use a loop, I would say. So. Analyze
analyzing recursive algorithms. When analyzing a loop, you determine the order of the loop body and then multiply it by the number of times the loop is executed. And then you get the level or the order of complexity that's associated with it. Recursive analysis is similar. You determine the order of the method body and then multiply it by the order of the recursion. How many times is it going to call itself? The number of times the recursive definition is followed is similar to the concept of the loop. So the efficiency is about the same in terms of the running time, the analysis of the algorithm there. For the Tower of Honey, the size of the problem is the number of disks and the operations on the interest in moving one disk. So expect the base case, except for the base case, each recursive call results in calling itself twice more because we have three, so we have the base plus two more to get all three of them processed to solve the problem of n disk. We have n to the second minus one disk moves. So that gives us an algorithm that has big O to the two to the two to the, to the n, which is called exponential complexity. Most of the um, if you're familiar with, I don't think we're gonna we're probably will hit it in this class, but there's a it's not a full algorithms course, it's a data structures course, but we can compare that with solutions for, let's say, for example, traveling salespeople algorithm, which is extremely expensive. It's a, it's a, it's a huge complication because of the number, sure number of routes in the search space. So depending upon how big the search space is, the recursive solution actually might lend itself to a more efficient loop in terms of the technique. So, seems like it was kind of quick, but that was recursion and uh, we always seem to get out early in this class too. <laughs> I don't know why. It just works out that way. Uh, but that is everything you ever wanted to know about recursion. Uh, next week on the agenda, let me throw recursion away so I don't get messed up with that. Next week I'm going to go over the midterm and I'm also going to go over the CSLOSA that is due next week. And I'm also going to go over this lecture and this lovely lecture is on sorting and searching. So we are going to hit at this point in our search through algorithms or search through data structures, we're going to actually kind of hit some algorithms that work with data structures um, and see them working together because we're going to essentially run out of data structures pretty soon. <laughs> so we'll look at the comparable interface. What I'm going to try and do is bring in some Java source code examples because it's a little bit more interesting. If I remember, I'll bring in some recursive examples. Hopefully I'll remember and we'll create some Java recursive functions and we'll see how it's working in real time. And then we'll go over the midterm and we'll go over the CSLO next week as well. So, unless we have any questions, we are done with our topic for today. You guys are going to think recursively now for the rest of the day? <laughs> <laughs> recursion, recursion, recursion. I can give this lecture all over again. That would be recursive. <laughs> I could call myself the, all right, now we're trying to start the class over again. Welcome back. <laughs> All right, we're done. <laughs> we're not doing that recursively. <laughs>